Wales, from coastline to castles, majestic mountain tops to vast valleys. That's where my family are from, don't get me started. A country full of myths, legends. Look what I got. And laughter. I'm here! Oh, my Lord! Join me, Michael Ball, as I receive a welcome in the hillside. Don't even think about it. Look at this view, man. Travelling across this incredible landscape. Jesus. I'll be rediscovering my Welsh heritage. It's a beautiful country, man. I've never felt more connected with the place. There is something about the Welsh giving a welcome. Tasting the local cuisine. Cheers. And taking in the spectacular scenery. <laughs> Embracing the culture. That is the most fabulous auditorium. And Celtic pride. In this wonderful land of song. There's something that makes you want to sing when you're up here. Marvellous. A lifetime's ambition is about to be achieved. <laughs> Smashing history, it really is. land of wine will still be singing when I come home again to Wales. Genuinely, I get an excited feeling when I cross this bridge and get into Wales. We're entering the land of my fathers. Well, the land of my mothers. Croeso y Gymru. Welcome to Wales. I spent my childhood summers up to mischief in the South Wales Valleys. So my first stop is somewhere I know well. Once an industrial heartland, to me, these terraces mean family. My mam grew up in the small town of Mountain Ash in the Cunnan Valley. Place which owes its very existence to the 19th century coal boom. Until the late 70s, it was home to one of the first deep coal mines in the area. Since the pit closed, nature has reclaimed the land. How green is my valley? Well, today, very. My gran. Agnes Lillian Davis, known to everyone as Lil, was a huge inspiration to me. She had the most beautiful singing voice, and if it wasn't for her and my Welsh influences, I might well have chosen a different career. My gran lived in a classic valley's terrace right here for most of her life. So this is number 30 Cadwallader Street, where my gran lived. It's so strange being back, because you imagine it. It's somewhere sort of huge. This was the longest street in the world. So much smaller than I remember. Gran was very much at the heart of the community. And although she has now gone, I still have family in this part of the world. So I'm off to see my favourite aunt, Auntie Denise. Oh, she makes me laugh. I bet you any money there'll be a big cake waiting for me and some Welsh cakes and a cup of tea and some good memories. Yes, I have some of my best memories here in Wales. And Auntie Denise's Ooh. always felt like home. It's only me. <laughs> oh, you've made a bit of an effort. <laughs> well... For my favourite neighbour, I've got oh, to make an effort, haven't I? That's beautiful, Jen. God. You're welcome. Am I cutting it or you? You can be mother. I'll be mother. <laughs> it's so lovely to have oh, you here. Oh, it's lovely to see you too. Do you know what? I think in here, I do feel Welsh. 
I know mm. I always make the joke, if it comes to rugby and war, I'll be a Welshman. And what about the singing side of it? And the singing side, without question. I mean, that comes from listening to the voices when I was here and, yeah. and feeling that proper deep down connection with it. Yeah. You've lived here all your life, haven't you? Yeah. How has it changed over the years? Well, quite a lot since the furnace I closed yeah. for a start because that was just a oh, filthy... It, I, well, I remember you do, the, you, you do the washing, Gran would get the mangle Terrible. out, I do the mangling, <laughs> you, you put out the washing and if the furnace light was on, everything was covered in smuts. Well, it was constant all day long. It was making smokeless fuel, wasn't it? Yes, but then you'd look up and you'd see the most beautiful mountains. What I loved about coming up here, it was the sense of freedom. Tony and I, and my cousin Tony, we'd be, we'd be out all, all day. day long. We were quite naughty, weren't we? I was putting it mildly, Mike. <laughs> Very mildly. Do you remember the greatest trick we played in Cadwallader Street? Knock down ginger. Yeah. Everyone that had a knocker on their front door, they tie the cotton or string onto that, run to another house, tie it on there, then run into Grand straight up the bedroom, and the three of you would be pulling and pulling like this now. <laughs> and everyone's knocking on the front door, we'd all be rattling at the same time. They don't. <laughs> It was funny, but it was annoying. Oh, we... <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> funny, but it annoying. It really was. <laughs> it really was annoying. Oh, it's been so lovely to relive old times with Auntie Den and find out how this area has changed since the colliery site closed. Like most families in the South Wales Valleys, mine has strong links with coal. Auntie Den's other half, my beloved Uncle Tom, worked in the industry on the railways and, unbelievably, my grandfather started working down a mine when he was just 14 years old. I'd like to understand more about what working life was like for them. And there's a place I can do just that, in the next valley. Gronda Heritage Park was once a working mine. Today, it's a visitor attraction. All the tour guides are former coal miners, including Tony Fiddler, who worked underground for nearly 20 years. This machine would be lowered in a cage, holding plus 50 men. Two decks on each cage, 25... Our first deck. stop is the engine winding house, which was used to lower colliers into the mine shaft and winch coal up to the surface. I mean, it's amazing engineering, brilliant. isn't it? This is Victorian engineering. It's absolutely know, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, and it still works. Yes, originally it would have been steam powered. Just. It's huge, isn't it? Yeah. And it was working 24 hours 24 a day. 24 hours a day, this would be going. So, how do we get down to the point? We'll go through this door now and we'll, right. we'll continue having a look around. Coming up, myself and Tony are heading deep underground. Very dark and apparently just as dangerous. Now, sometimes. The ropes that control these cages do break. Don't say that they as we're going down, Tom. It hasn't happened here for quite a while. Oh, it? that's good to know. So it's about you. I'm Michael Ball. And I'm on a mission to explore wonderful Wales. My travels have brought me to the South Wales Valleys and Rhondda Heritage Park, where I'm on a tour with Tony, a former coal miner. When I was working, it was roughly about seven and a half hours. You work underground and you have a 20 minute break. This colliery once employed 3,000 people. The Rhondda Valleys was one of the most important coal mining areas in the world, and the Titanic was even steam-powered using coal from here. We leave, we leave the God's beautiful sunshine outside into the dark, dark world of underground. Yes. So how deep are we going here? 1,400 feet in depth. Did you get nervous? Ever? I got nervous every time I got in the cage. Did you? Because if you've got 25 men in a cage, I guess you can imagine it is very, very tight space. Yeah. You haven't got a lot of room to move in these, in these cages. 
Now, sometimes the ropes that control these cages do break. Don't say that they as do. we're going downtown. Yeah, it hasn't happened here for quite a while. Oh, it? that's good to know. So it's about you. <laughs> this mine was as deep as the Empire State Building is high, but luckily we're not going that far today. And this is what we emerge into. This is how we'll be. This is how you step out of pit water, then you go off to your, to your working place. Some of the working places could be two miles away from pit water. You walk that distance yeah, before yeah, you start yeah. work. Sometimes you could be hands and knees in different conditions. And of course, we're lucky down here. We got a, a bit of electric light. Back in the day, it was candlelight or gaslight. Yeah. And a miner's lamp like that. Lamp. Okay. The coal that was mined here could fill 50 double decker buses every single day. Black gold, as it was known, shaped the valleys and its people. The men were working down here, the women, children working down here. They came from everywhere. Ireland, Scotland, England, people coming in because they heard that there's money to be earned in South Wales, down the mines. And also then the nickname started. You. I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Die Bungalow. Die Bungalow. Nothing of nothing stairs. <laughs> and you had uh, Tommy 18 months. You only had one and a half years. You know? <laughs> Tommy Champ, Uncle Tom, know Tom well. You knew Tom? I know Tom, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. I used to mime in the same choir as him. <laughs> Oh, lovely job, Tom. Yeah. Cracking voice. Cracking uh, voice. The best. Uncle Tom wouldn't even let me in the top tenors. I was in second tenors. Can I ask Where are you? you? Second tenors. You're second? Yeah. That's all right then, bud. Yeah, no you, problem. We can mime together. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the point. The humour, the camaraderie, the, yes. the, 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 the sense of community yeah. that these tough environments created yeah. was what got people through. Yeah. The community in, in, in South Wales is second and then. No. The communities are still there now, but it's a different type of community, yeah. of course. Whilst the Welsh Valleys provided so much power to the rest of the world, and that sense of community for families, it was also a tough and often dangerous landscape to grow up in. I'm heading towards the Taff Valley. So we're on our way now to a place that I've heard about all my life, but I've never visited, Abavan. It's extremely hard to comprehend on such a beautiful day, but over 50 years ago, this small village of Abavan was home to a devastating disaster. 28 adults and 116 children, seemingly safe in the local school, were killed due to a catastrophic landslide of coal waste. Almost an entire generation was completely wiped out. It's going to be a privilege to speak to Jeff Edwards, one of the very few survivors from that day. Hiya, Jeff. Hello, Michael. Good to see you. Welcome to Aberfan. Thank you. What an extraordinary, beautiful day. Glorious. A beautiful place with such a sad, sad history. Now a peaceful memorial garden, this site was once his school, Pantglass Juniors. Are you able to recognise where the different classrooms were? Yes. The only actual part of this memorial garden that existed in 1966 was the far wall uh, at the end of the memorial gardens. Mm. The rest of it was designed by major architects of the time and is representative of uh, the classrooms uh, within Panclass School. The date was the 21st of October. It had been raining for weeks. One of the nearby coal waste tips was situated 100 feet high on the hillside above Jeff's school. Can you remember what happened that day? Yes, I used to live on Abervan Road, and uh, my best friend Robert used to live two doors down from me. We got out tack, and then we walked to the school. 
My seat was two doors up from the door of the classroom. There was then a, a rumbling sound. And the next thing I remember was uh, waking up uh, with people uh, just screaming, really, get me out, get me out. I didn't really know what had happened to me. The coal waste created an avalanche, engulfing everything in its path. I was buried under all this material that had come down from the tip. The roof had collapsed. And the reason why I survived was the fact that I had a pocket of air around me. And uh, that's all I could see is out into the sky, really. And then the next thing I heard was the smash uh, of the window with the rescuers coming in. And uh, eventually they pulled me out. The trauma of living through this disaster will be with Jeff forever. Robert, my friend, who I walked to school with that day, didn't return to his parents. And, uh, you know, out of the 34 in our class, only four of us um, survived. So the impact on us was uh, quite horrific, really. Yeah. That will be with us until we die. We'll never get away no. from it. Uh, you manage to cope with it, but you don't actually get over it. And mm. um, why have why? I survived and others haven't? Yeah. Um, and I think part of my life has been to make a difference to others. Jeff's been instrumental in creating Abervan's beautiful memorial sites, enabling visitors to come here and reflect. All my life, I grew up hearing about this story and knew about it. But coming here, there is a sense of a sense of peace. It has reaffirmed my belief in this area. And the reason for that is the power of the community. I find this a very tranquil place. I do like coming here. I can reflect here of the good times rather than the bad yeah. times. It's a privilege to, to be on this site and talking to you. It really is. Thank you. I'll never forget meeting Jeff and witnessing for myself the remarkable transformation that's taken place over the past 55 years in this area. And to have time to reflect on the Abervan disaster and its appalling consequences. It's important we don't forget about those things and that we learn from them and we endeavor to never let them happen again. Well, next, I'm heading west to the Gower Peninsula, a stunning stretch of coastline beyond the city of Swansea. It was the first place to be called an area of outstanding natural beauty in the whole of the UK. It's home to indigenous wild ponies, picturesque farmland, and the landscape also provides rich territory for the seafood industry. One of the jewels in its crown is Rossilli and its worm's head. It's three miles of golden sand and dramatic cliff tops mean it's been voted as one of the best beaches in the world. It's absolutely spectacular. I'm hitching a ride to the Lucha Estuary. Because not only is this area breathtakingly beautiful, it's also known for being the best spot for cockle picking in this part of the world. Come on, boys, show Let's me go. the cockles. Come on, <laughs> Meet the boys from Selwyn Seafoods. Dad Brian, his son Ashley, and his son Garen. Three generations. What do I need? What do you need? Only these. Rake, riddle, and bucket. Yeah. They're hoping to try and teach me the tricks of the trade. How do we know where there are any cockles? See these little holes here? Yeah. Right. The good chance is something underneath there. Right. So starting very slowly. Like yeah, that. that's a good that's a good way to learn. <laughs> and then we're just going to scratch. 
There's a little bit of sarcasm going on. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so then we're just right. going to scratch the surface from left to right, just yeah. taking the cockles out, and then we're going to riddle it. Keep it away from you. Just, yeah, you're kind of losing the food. That's what I shake it. Look, it has Look. Yeah. See how many he had? I know. I think you're an archer, boy. Are you a yeah, 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 Definitely. Do you want me yeah. to give me a job? Yep, absolutely. Can you sing? Everybody can sing out to you because nobody can hear them. Yes. So, <laughs> everyone can sing, but not everyone wants to listen. When, yeah. when these little cockles will, will grow, yeah. millions of them, little cockles, they spit up at the same time and they can hear something, we say it's singing. Yeah, so when you ask us the question, how do we know where the cockles are, they sing to yeah, us. I'm honest to God, you can ask any cockle well, gather on. And that's true. Yeah. So, Brian, yeah? how long have you been doing this? Oh, my God, 52, 53 years. You came down with your dad? Yeah, and my mother. My mother used to pick them, and my father. What's the business like now? It's quite stable at the moment. Yeah. Um, there seems to be quite a good European market for um, cockles, uh, particularly in the south of Spain, for the tapas market in cans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So majority of the cockles in the UK and Europe end up in Spain, uh, which does demand quite a high price for the fishermen. But we still don't go too far away from what we've always been taught, which is the local market. So we cook a small couple ourselves in our factory, sell them in our shop, and make sure the people of South Wales still get pen cloud cockles readily available for them. Well, I remember the cockle man coming to Mountain Ash. That's right. That was my father. Was he, he really? Yeah. So that's where it started from a very small acorn or cockle. What oh, a tig. Yeah, you, well, a tig. <laughs> I can give you a job. You're a, you're a pro at it, but. In the early 20th century, most of the cockle pickers here were women who would walk and sell them at Swansea Market. The method used to gather them remains the same and is apparently the secret to their flavour. See that meat? Yeah. That tastes like, a, like an oyster. It's so sweet. The saltness from the sea. A little bit of grit. A little bit of, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of grit, that makes it better. But it's something different now. Not That's... many people eat them like that. No, why? No. That's the taste, the taste of the sea right there. Absolutely. Do you eat them raw? No. Never tried. No, You've never tried. Do you want to try? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You've stitched me up. <laughs> no, no, lots of people have. <laughs> Get off my side, then. <laughs> oh, they really were delicious. And it looks as if this family business is in very safe hands for future generations to come. Now I've found out how the local seafood gets gathered in these parts, I think it's time to learn how it gets cooked. The sacrifices I'm prepared to make for this programme... Oh, I've now got to go to Oxwich Bay, to a Michelin-starred restaurant, and have lunch. I mean... <laughs> giving. That's all I do. The Oxwich Beach House is home to head chef Howell Griffith, who you might have seen on a TV show or two. He opened this restaurant in 2016 and has since won several accolades, including his first Michelin star. I've challenged him to make an award-winning dish using the cockles I collected earlier, along with other local ingredients. Time to find out what he's rustled up. How? Hello. How are you? I'm good, Ben. Excellent. What do we... Oh. Can I just say before we start? Yes, of course. I have eaten in worse places. It's all right, I mean, it? look yeah. at this. <laughs> It's stunning. How long have you been here? It's a wonderful location. We've been here just over four years now. Because you're a Welshman, but you're North Wales. I am. Was it OK making the move? Well, I was coming back from England, so it wasn't that bad. Oh, it's even yeah, better then. Yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah, <laughs> There's yeah, no yeah. problem there. And everything that you try and, and, and do here, you try and source as locally as possibly, don't As you? local as possible. You can see out in the bay, yeah. this lobster was caught by Jim, the left-hand side blue boat, and they actually <laughs> fish out of the bay. So this is as probably the most local ingredient you don't get we, fresh We in, have do you? on the restaurant. No, they're, they're, it's a fantastic product. The lava bread, which comes from North Gower. Do you know what's embarrassing? I've yeah. never eaten lava bread. Have you not? What is it? It's wonderful. It's seaweed. We cool. use it in bread, we use it in 
you know, courses. We're using all sorts of stuff in the restaurant, and it's beautiful. Well, I'm here in a Michelin-starred restaurant. Yes. Gazing over the sea. Let's see if you've earned it. <laughs> here we go. That's gorgeous. Good. What do you think of the lava bread? It's First lovely. Time. It's not overpowering at all. Nice squeeze of lemon juice so you've got a bit of acidity. Yeah. Kind of cleans it up as you eat. Yeah. Have you got any ketchup? <laughs> no ketchup. <laughs> I love it. I can't actually think of a, a more beautiful spot. It's wonderful. To have a glass of wine, some gorgeous food and, and a nice chat. Thanks so much, Howell. No problem. I might have to have a little sip of this. Well, there you go. I'll Cheers, join kid. you. Yachida. Yachida. Oh, what fabulous food and an incredible location for a restaurant. Sadly, it's time to say goodbye to this part of South Wales. Coming up, I'll be treading the boards in Cardiff. That is the most fabulous auditorium before exploring its bay in style. I'm Michael Ball and I'm exploring my Welsh roots with a trip around this great nation. My travels have so far taken me to many of the best places South Wales has to offer. It's rolling hills, it's lush green fields, it's extraordinary bays and sea views. Absolutely beautiful. And my next stop is Cardiff and a theatre I know extremely well. This is the front entrance of the Millennium Centre. And I've been coming here since it opened. In fact, I helped to open it, performing for Her Majesty in 2004. It's a world-class venue and I am delighted to be back. What I love about this place is everything that it's been constructed with speaks of Wales. The wood and the slate and the, the design even. An enormous stage can house any size of production. And then you look out and you see that is the most fabulous auditorium. And you can hear already that the acoustic is perfect. When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drums, it is the future that may win tomorrow. Comes. One of my biggest musical influences was my Welsh gran. She passed away when I was 22 and never got to see me perform here. But I wanted to make sure she would always have the best seat in the house. J17, my gran, Agnes Lillian Davis, an inspiration. What she wouldn't have given to be able to, to see me up on that stage singing would have been a proudest moment. But there's no one prouder of me than her daughter, my mum. And it's about time I checked in. Hi, darling. Hiya, mum. You're right. Guess where I am? Where? I'm in Grand's seat at the Millennium Centre. No. Yeah. It's really been oh, an extraordinary couple of days. Amazing going back up to Cadwallader Street, and then I went down a pit. You enjoyed that? Well, I did, but you know what? I wouldn't have wanted to work down one. It's, yeah. a, it's another world, it really is. Absolutely. It's fantastic. I mean, I went cockle picking yesterday. Oh, we used to do that. Did you? Delicious. Did you eat yes. them raw? No. I did. Well, of course you did, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I'll eat anything, me. You couldn't wait for them to be cooked, could you? <laughs> I know him so well. <laughs> it's the trip of a lifetime for me. It really oh. is. I, I've never felt more connected with the place. Yeah, and do you know what? Definitely. 
I couldn't be more proud of the fact that I am. Nah, it's a beautiful country, man. I'm so glad you're enjoying it. I'm loving it. I really am. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good time. All right. Stay God bless. Bye, sweetheart. Ta-da. Well, today, the Millennium Centre is a central part of the Cardiff Bay skyline, but the adjacent dockland known as Tiger Bay is famous as the birthplace of the darling diva, Shirley Bassey. But she wasn't the only world-class export out of the docks. Cardiff Bay was once the biggest exporter of coal in the world. At its peak over 100 years ago, more than 10 million tonnes of coal left here in one year making its way to every country in the British Empire. Its great success meant seafarers from around the world would arrive for work and settle here, like Gaynor Legal's grandfather, a Jamaican merchant seaman. Coal was king at that time, you know, the 19th century, and it, it fueled the empire. Gaynor was born and bred a stone's throw away in the area of Butte Town. All of this was dockland, with lots of to in and fro in, the trains coming down from the valleys full of coal and being loaded on the ships. We had a dry dock where ships came in to repairs. So it was really busy. So a really thriving area. Absolutely thriving. So Britain got its wealth because of the coal from the South Wales valleys and because of transporting that coal to the rest of the world. It's thought that people from at least 50 nationalities settled in this area, and a multicultural community was grown, the first of its type in the UK. Tell me what it was like growing up in Tiger Bay then. I have been accused of making it into this wonderland, this perfect place, but it was in lots of ways a perfect childhood. It was, we felt safe yeah. and we felt protected, we had all sorts of people living with us, amongst us, different religions, different cultures, and we just all... To a real melting pot. Absolutely. But we were friends. This is what I'm finding everywhere I go in Wales, the sense of community, the sense of looking out for each other. It seems really strong and really important here. I think it is, and that was the, the reputation. Yeah. I think because Tiger Bay and the people in it were seen as different and alien, they gathered together yeah. and supported each other. Well, the Butte Town community is as strong as ever, and Cardiff Bay has since been developed, and its restaurants and tourist attractions centre around a beautiful freshwater lake. And there's only one way to experience it. Sam! Hi, Michael, how, how are you doing? Are you, how are you? You're right. The developments have led to fresh employment opportunities, and for Sam Hartley, that means boat trips. When did the regeneration of the uh, the bay start? Well, it's, the, the actual build started in 1994, and it was in, it completed in 1999, and that was really the catalyst for the regeneration of Cardiff Bay, the two billion pound catalyst. And now you've got luxury flats, you've got great shopping area, you've got. The theatre, it's another heart to Cardiff. Absolutely, it? yeah. The Cardiff Bay Barrage was one of the largest civil engineering projects in Europe. It also means boats like ours can easily access the Bristol Channel, and it provides a valuable flood defence for the city. So they're the five sluice gates. They regulate the, the levels of the bay. They let the water out depending on how much is coming down the rivers and depending on how high the tides are going to be. What's good to see? Going around South Wales, you see these amazing industrial feats of engineering. Feats of engineering. Yeah. And this is on a par with that, isn't it? Yeah. So it, we're it still is, able to do it. It's pretty impressive. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And of course, here we're quite calm because we're in the bay. We're quite calm what, at the moment. What's it going to be like when we get <laughs> a out? A little bit choppy. <laughs> <laughs> see, I don't mind that. Yeah, do you know what? I might just regret that last comment. Ah! <laughs> Come to Wales, they said. What have a gentle <laughs> wander round. <laughs> I'm getting soft, man. Oh. <laughs> Are we going home now? I think so, yeah, we're <laughs> in that direction. <laughs>
Well, that was an exhilarating trip in every sense of the word. I'm soaked right through my pants. <laughs> I did tell you to bring all the full water. Yeah, well, today, you, know. you know, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my agent? <laughs> and coming up, I'm heading to the stadium to reminisce about its opening with a Welsh rugby legend. It just felt like all roads led to a new chapter. Yeah. And joining me in song, well, it's the Trioppi Male Voice Choir. I'm Michael Ball, and I'm on a trip around wonderful Wales. When you think of Wales, you think of rugby. And when you think of rugby, you think of Cardiff's impressive stadium. Wales forever! Wales forever! Wales I was lucky enough to perform at the official opening over 20 years ago at the Rugby World Cup. It's one of the biggest highlights of my career to date, singing the anthem Cum Ronda. I'm catching up with Welsh rugby legend Colin Chavis. On that day, Wales played Argentina, and his performance almost certainly outshone mine. I'll never forget that day, because I was lucky to be part of the, the opening ceremony, get to sing Bread of Heaven. The atmosphere in that stadium was unlike anything I'd seen before or seen since. It, it was electric. And you go and score the first try. Yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> I can't remember how many Argentinians I ran round on that day, um, <laughs> but it just felt incredible. And that, you know, right from that minute we walked down that tunnel, I remember just thinking, today is gonna be amazing. Yeah. And to have such a wonderful stadium, you know, and opening the Rugby World Cup 1999, it just felt like all roads led to a new chapter. Yeah. The Principality Stadium is one of Wales' most iconic buildings. Its retractable roof is the largest in Europe. For Welsh rugby fans, it's our Colosseum, our alternative cathedral. It's a place of worship. What do you think it is about rugby that is so important to the people of Wales? It's not just the national sport, it's almost the national religion. We have a, a mining history, a farming history, docks, steel industry, you know, there's a lot about Wales that is difficult, is tough. So it creates a different breed of person. And I think if we can reflect that in our rugby team, you know, you have to roll up your sleeves, you're gonna get dirty yeah. and you're gonna bleed, you know, and you have to do it together. And I think it was that camaraderie and the values that that builds within your team that is why Wales love rugby so much. Yeah. I have one more thing for you. What's that? Our good friends at the Welsh Rugby Union are providing you with a lovely jersey. Oh! And what they've knocked up for you? Oh, don't! Number five. There you go. Thank you so much, Cop. That's amazing! Thank You're you welcome. so much for this. It's been great to reminisce with Colin about our performances 20 years ago when I sang Cum Ronda, or Bread of Heaven as it's better known. And before I can leave South Wales, there's one final thing I need to do. I'm at Cathartha Castle in Merthyr Tydfil to meet Gareth Evans, one of the original members of the infamous Trioki Male Voice Choir. Well, this is a nice spot, Gareth. It's beautiful, isn't it? Look at it. So, yep. Triochi, yep. Male Voice Choir, yep. coming up to its 75th anniversary. That's it, yeah. October the 16th, 1946, that's when it all started. It's something that we saw so proud of. What is lovely about the choir yeah. is it's taken the boys literally all over the world. The first Welsh choir to sing in the Sydney Opera House. Well, funny you should mention Australia. I walk into the foyer of the hotel. Yeah. And, and we're in Brisbane. Yeah. We're in, we're the, I couldn't get further away, and there you yeah. all are. 
yeah. in the lobby. I know, I know. Remember what I said? Yeah, you came in, you said, Trioki, we said yes, and you, you said to some of the boys, you know, what are you doing here? And they said, well, we've just done a gig in town. <laughs> you said, no wonder no bugger come to see me. <laughs> <laughs> how, do I, how do I compete with you boys? <laughs> Moments like that will carry forever in our memories, you know. Highlights of meeting people such as yourself, being in places in different parts of the world because we are there because we represent in Trioki. Yeah. You can't play it. Well, we're going to get a chance to sing together again. Hopefully a bit better than we did in the bar in Brisbane. <laughs> 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 And there's only yeah. one song. Definitely. Come on, let's do it. Okay. A bit of Kondronva? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I hope you've got the right key. <laughs> Fabulous stuff. Well, and Michael is back next Friday night at 8. God's Own County puts on a festival of food and farming like no other. Spend today at the Great Yorkshire Show next Wednesday and Thursday at 8. Next tonight on Channel 5, we're pulling the plug to reveal the secrets and stories of a Scottish spectacle. Draining Loch Ness. Brand new in just a moment.